Hello booktube, I'm here today with a book review for Orange is the New Black by Piper Kerman. Um, the full, um, full title is Orange is the New Black, My Year in a Women's Prison. Um, and as it's become a lot more popular when the, um, because of the Netflix series, the Netflix TV series, um, which is, which just finished its fourth season. I'm a fan of Netflix TV series as well, um, but it was inspired by this memoir and then has been expanded upon and dramatized for television and things like that. But I thought, you know, um, um, why not learn more about mass incarceration? And I was just kind of curious to read the original book that inspired the series. So this book is a memoir of the author's time in prison when, um, for a crime that she committed 10 years earlier, she carried a suitcase full of drug money um, across international borders and um, eventually, like long story short, and with lots of like legal jargon, she got caught and implicated by um, other, um, other members of the drug ring um, that she was a part of for like a month and um, she had to go to prison. Um, so she, um, and uh, Piper Kerman was not the, um, and she writes this from the beginning. She's not the typical type of person who prisons are meant to attract. She came, she was a white woman. She came from a wealthy family and she had, um, she was a graduate of Smith. She had studied theater. Um, she, um, so she wasn't the typical person who was supposed to get caught in the prison industrial system. But she, because of that, she uses her ability for, she uses the ability that we have to listen to white people about things, and um, and she wrote a memoir about her experience. This book isn't, if you're looking for a typical um, year in the life of a woman's prison, um, or for what um, most people go through, this isn't what, this book isn't for you. Um, it's, um, she does a good job exposing, I would say it's a good introduction to the prison system, um, if you are unfamiliar with it or unfamiliar with the American prison system. Um, she does a good job of um, contextualizing her memoir and of placing, in, um, and of placing herself within the demographics that um, go to prison and um, as well as she has a level of self-awareness that is um, that is very key um, and very much appreciated from the memoir. She is, um, um, like she talks about how the fact that she could afford a lawyer, um, or, um, despite the fact that she was working like as a waitress at the time, the fact that she could afford a lawyer meant that her sentence was only 15 months and then she got released after 13 for good behavior. Um, but her sentence was only 15 months, whereas many other women who had public defenders, and it's not public defenders fault, it's just that they have so many cases, they can have average, I think the average is the time that they get spent on each case is seven seconds, <laughs> um, that they don't have the time to properly counsel each of their defendants. So, um, so she talks about how some women got caught for pay for, like, having an ounce of marijuana and got, like, 60 months. Um, and so it's, um, it's a very personal memoir, but it's also quite funny. Um, she has a lot of funny experiences, and I think it's good if you're at all curious about the system. And again, too, I think it's, um, I think it's more of an introductory book about mass incarceration than, like, a thorough comprehensive guide. Um, if you're looking for something that's a little bit more lighthearted, um, she does talk about the racial inequalities in the system and the war on drugs and the impact that that has had on um, American mass incarceration. And, um, and also, too, like, some of the math. Um, I mean, like, I'm not a mathematician, but if, like, someone, for example, like, commits uh, food stamps fraud or something and they, um, and they steal, like, steal about like a thousand dollars from the government they might go to prison for at least a year but it costs um but um it costs thirty thousand dollars to ha to house one inmate in prison for a year so it's like oh so this person stole third all oh, one thousand dollars worth but we're going to you know use three thirty thousand dollars to incarcerate them for at least a year and that's not even including the fact that most people who are incarcerated are reincarcerated and have difficulties finding jobs and there's really no rehabilitation programs for them um she talks about that. She talks about the revolving door of the um, between the prison system and the poor communities, and how um, a lot of these people they want to return to the working economy um, and not to like the drug game. But there really is no option for them because they don't because they've only been working in the underground economy their entire lives. They don't know. Um, and there's nothing in prison to teach them marketable skills so that they don't have to go back to selling drugs. Um, and 
um, prison for her was a time that was contemplative to, for her to realize like what she had done by being part of a like heroin um, smuggling ring and she really um, and um, to reflect on mass incarceration and um, she does a good job I think of again providing an introduction to this experience um, just something that I wanted to read um, this is from her afterward the United States is the biggest prison population in the world. We incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners, though we are only 5% of the world's population. This reliance on prisons is recent. In 1980, we had about 500,000 Americans in prison. Now we have more than 2.3 million people locked up. A huge part of that gro growth is represented by people like the women I did time with. Low-level offenders who have made serious mistakes but pose little threat of violence. Most of the women I know from prison have lived lives that were missing opportunities many of us take for granted. It sometimes seems that we have built revolving doors between our poorest communities and correctional facilities and created perverse financial incentives that keep the, those prisons full at taxpayers' expense. America has he invested heavily in prisons while the public institutions that actually prevent crime and strengthen communities, schools, hospitals, libraries, museums, community centers, go without. Incredible things can happen behind prison walls because people are so remarkably resilient. We can survive almost anything. One of the reasons that harsh punishment alone doesn't bear fruit. In order for prisons to serve, truly serve the public, the people who run them would do well to aspire to the words of Thomas Moat Osborne, the storied warden of New York's Sing Sing prison in the early part of the 20th century, who vowed, we will turn this prison from a scrap heap into a repair shop. Um, and um, so she does a good job of addressing that mentality that we have of like, where we like throw people away and we just like put people in prison and the vast majority of these people are, um, and she was in a minimum security facility, by the way, um, the vast majority of these people in minimum security and in maximum security will re-enter society at some point. So it's in our best interest if they don't get crazier and if they don't get angrier and more damaged and um, if they learn marketable skills and they learn ways to um, rehabilitate into society. Because um, again, if they go out into the world and they can't find a job and they can't go anywhere, they're more likely to end up back in prison, um, which again will cost everyone more money, not to mention ruin their lives, um, lives, or, you know, be dependent upon government assistance or live in poverty or, and all of these aren't good options. We want everyone to have, you know, um, have a, sus um, a sustainable form of life. And um, so she does a good job of this again. Um, and it is funnier than I anticipated if you're at all curious about like what happens behind prison and you know like the um, and the meals that they get and um, like um, how women form bonds and prison families and things like that it is interesting the few criticisms that I have heard of this is that it's not um, a memoir that's iconic of the um, of the racial segregation that occur not racial segregation the race um, the institutional racism within the system. Again, she does know where she's coming from, which is like a privileged white woman who went to prison who wasn't supposed to go to prison for um, for these types of crimes. Like the laws in America, even on the war on drugs, are pretty racist. Like um, I don't know if this was alone, no longer. I don't know if this is still the case, but I know at least like a few years ago. Like if you going going to prison for you could, if you had crack cocaine you um, could go to prison for, you had to go to prison for like at least 10 years. Whereas if you had powder cocaine, you went to prison for like one year and black people do use crack cocaine way more than white people. And it's like, it's the same thing. <laughs> but so why is there such a disparity between um, like the sentencing times between these, um, between these two drugs? Also too, like if you look at the death penalty, who gets the death penalty? Um, like uh, um, black convicts and uh, Hispanic convicts are, convicts are way more likely to get it than um, white female convicts or white convicts at all. Um, so it's kind of applied disproportionately, even though the same people are committing these crimes. Um, so we just have to figure out a better solution than to essentially like toss these people away in prison because they will be coming back. Um, and um, yeah, but so a lot of the criticism I've heard is that it's not... Um, is that she, um, it's not iconic of the prison system, but I think she never claims to be. She never claims to, that she understands the, um, the systematic oppression. She is just using her privilege to cast an eye out for, um, for people to shed, she's just using her privilege to cast a light out, um, cast a light on the, um, on the injustices within the prison system. And I think she's done a good job with that because honestly, without this book, there wouldn't be the TV series. And about the TV series, no one ever really talked about women's prisons before. Um, 
And so it's like, um, and I think at least we're having conversations about it now. And I think the book has done its job on that. It hasn't told us what the solution is. It just told us, it just alerted us to the fact that there is a problem. And the, her target demographic, which is people who didn't know about prison, who were maybe white or maybe um, more upper middle class or wealthy, people who didn't know, who weren't likely to go to prison um, and didn't necessarily care about mass incarceration before, now they know. And now they know about the racial injustices and the poverty and the uh, destitution. And so now we can have a national conversation about it. So yeah, because of that, I gave it four out of five stars. I did enjoy it. I would recommend it if you're looking for... Um, it sounds weird because it is a little bit more lighthearted than a memoir about prison would be. She has some funny stories and things like that. Um, but yeah, and it's a quick read too. It's just about 300 pages. So um, yeah, thanks for listening to my review. Wow, I realized I talked kind of fast throughout all of that. That's weird. All right. Bye.